I'm Lisa Lampert. I teach in the literature department at UC San Diego, and I'm also currently the director of the Jewish Studies program. Um, and along with the European Studies program, I'm uh, very pleased to welcome Do Dr. Sally Deborah Charno um, to join us this evening to talk about her new book on Edmund Flagg. Um, Professor Charno teaches at Hofstra University, and she's written a new book, a new critical history on Flake's life. Um, and um, I've come to think of him as the French Jewish intellectual that not many of us know about, but that we really should all know about, especially right now um, at this moment in time. And I think the talk tonight will show us why if you've never heard of Edmund Flake before. Um, so, um, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to note that next week, the Jewish Studies Program and the Holocaust Living History Workshop um, will have another event. Um, on January 19th, um, they will present A Child in Birkenau with George and Stephanie Heimler. And we also have other events planned for the coming months. Um, but as you might know, UCC is virtual at the moment. Um, we're kind of, we have we have events planned out, but we're we're kind of waiting to see um, how things will work out. Um, and we appreciate you being flexible and we're trying to be flexible as we move forward in our activities so that we can um, still keep meeting with each other and talking and learning, but keep um, everyone in our community as safe as we possibly can. Um, and I'd like to, to thank Jen Schwartzkopf and especially Anne-Marie Bienviaje for um, setting up the Zoom and the meeting so that we can talk to each other and share ideas um, and learn more together, even while we're physically um, separated. Um, and um, our speaker is actually joining us from New York City. So we're, we're very separated, but um, some of the silver lining um, that's come from the pandemic, at least for me, and we were talking about this a little bit more before the talk, we were waiting you know, for the talk to begin, is that um, Zoom technology has allowed us to, you know, speak with people in ways that we never would have thought of before, pull together events in ways that we never would have thought of before. And um, I feel kind of lucky to have met Professor Charno because it was kind of a pandemic event. Um, I had been uh, researching Edmund Flagg because he wrote um, several works that deal with the wandering Jew. And I've been researching the wandering Jew figure. And during the pandemic, it's been difficult to get some of the books that we want to get um, because the libraries are closed. So I bought a book of his from the 30s on eBay. And when it showed up, this old letter fell out of it from 1934 from um, his American publisher to a prominent bishop in New York City. And there were some things about the letter that puzzled me. And I thought, you know, I've been reading this professor's work on Flag, and I've learned a lot from it. And the, the pandemic has kind of emboldened me. I've started to, you know, I'm just, I'm just gonna write to her. I'm gonna tell her I like her work and about this letter. And then I had a very generous response. She helped me with the letter. Um, she read what I wrote on Flag and gave me great commentary. And she shared this book that we're gonna be talking about tonight before it was published so that I could, could learn from it for my own work. So that was a, a really nice experience. And, you know, I hope we've all had some positive pandemic experiences. And and this is one of the ones that, that I'm going to um, remember. And really, um, I feel very lucky um, that, it, that it happened. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, Sally Charno, who's uh, currently serving as the chair of Hofstra's history department. Um, she's professor of modern European post-colonial history and women's studies at Hofstra. And she's trained not only in history, but in performance studies. So her work brings together issues of cultural production, art and politics, and also minority subcultures in France and beyond. Her first book was Theater, Politics and Markets in Fin de Siècle Paris, Staging Modernity. And she's also recently edited a volume called Artistic Expressions and the Great War, A Hundred Years On. In addition, she's published numerous scholarly pieces in Radical History Review, the American Historical Review, French History, and more. And she's also served as the co-president of the Society for French Historical Studies. So this latest book, Edmund Flagg and Jewish Minority Culture, 
in 20th century France appeared with Rutledge in 2021. And it's a beautifully researched and written account of the life of Edmund Flagg, who was born in 1874 and died in 1963. And what Professor Charno manages to do in this critical study of Flagg's life is to situate it within very important, really, you know, from French Jewish history, critical moments um, in French Jewish history in a way that illuminates both of these histories. So Flagg lived through the time of the Dreyfus Affair and both world wars. He was active and effective in efforts to save children during the period of Nazi occupation and the Vichy regime. And he was before and after the Second World War at the forefronts of efforts to promote ecumenical understanding and cooperation and to forge a powerful and fulfilling vision of what it means to be French and to be Jewish. Charno's study of each phase of Flagg's life illuminates this story, but also the story of Jews in France. So I heartily recommend this book. And I think we have a link um, where you can learn more about the book um, and connect with the publisher. Um, and I, it's, a, it's just, it's just a beautiful, it's very, you know, especially right now, I hope we'll discuss a little bit what flag might mean in this current moment, because I found the book not only, I learned a lot, but I found it very moving. And, um, you know, his, the story of his life and the story of what he did with that life to be very moving. So Professor Charno is going to present um, some work from her book and teach us a little bit about Flag. Um, and um, afterwards, I will, if you drop questions into the chat, if you type them into the chat, then I can um, bring your questions um, to the speaker and we can, we can begin a discussion that way. Um, and so now I'll turn it over. Um, thank you so much for joining us, um, Professor Charno, and um, we're all looking forward to learning more about Edmund Flagg and your work. Thank you so much, Lisa, and um, thank you for inviting me to, um, to San Diego. And uh, I'm grateful to you and to the Jewish Studies Program for making this event happen, and also to Anna Marie Buen Viaje for actually making it happen in the world of technology. Um, I just want to say that uh, uh, truly one of the most wonderful aspects, whether it's in real life or in virtual life, um, one of the most gratifying parts of our world, I think, is being able to be in conversation with one another um, about the things that we're interested in and how they fit together and how they connect. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I am going to share my screen. And so I'll be, I'll, I'll speak a little bit, about a half an hour, uh, with uh, some images, and then we'll open it up for, for conversation. Okay. So can we, we can see this, right? Yes, it's good. Okay. So as you can see from the title of my book, um, Edmund, oh, wait a minute. There we go. Um, Edmund Flagg, Jewish Minority Subculture in 20th Century France, that this is a biography and it's focused on this French Jewish writer. He's probably the most famous of such writers that you've actually never, ever heard of. And that's in fact where I begin the story. Why and how did this incredibly famous writer who was so influential in France, especially in the 1920s and 30s, uh, in defining Jewish identity in this period, how did he disappear? Why did he disappear from discussions of Jewish identity after the Second World War? Why haven't we heard about him? And how did I hear about him is the other question. So just to backtrack, I first met Edmund Flagg when I was working on my first book that Lisa mentioned on theater and politics in late 19th, 19th century Paris, um, because he was a playwright and he wrote mostly symbolist plays and they were performed uh, in avant-garde theaters around and about Paris in the late 19, 1890s before turning to his Jewishness as literary inspiration, he really focused on these kind of idea plays or psychological dramas. So I met him there 
And then I followed him into his world in the 1920s. The book begins with the death of the 89 year old flag on October 16th, 1963. And at the time of his death, he was recognized as one of France's most influential writers, having authored 17 plays and operas, 10 books of poetry, four novels, as well as countless essays. He compiled anthologies and translated and adapted work by other acclaimed writers and poets. His funeral procession in Paris was attended by thousands of friends and colleagues and admirers. The flag archive is replete with hundreds of condolence cards and letters uh, that were written to Madeleine, his widow, from people from Marc Chagall, the famous uh, painter, to the well-known Catholic intellectual Jacques Maritain. Flegg was one of France's leading writers. He was instrumental in forging a modern French Jewish identity in the 20th century. And yet, despite his notoriety and even celebrity, few have heard of him. So my question began with why has Flegg's centrality to French Jewish self-understanding faded from memory in the years after 1945? The short answer is that the meaning of Jewish identity itself in France became the focus of philosophers rather than of literary writers, poets, etc. after the Holocaust. And especially the question of Jewish identity became central after Jean-Paul Sartre wrote The Anti-Semite and the Jew. And that became the sort of central focus of questions of identity in post-war France. I've structured my talk this evening around a series of five elements in this project that surprised me. So I have five surprises that I wanna share with you. Surprise number one, what I found was that even though Flegg's work had, <clears throat> had seemed to disappear, it hadn't really. It found its voice in the work of the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas after the war. Levinas knew Flegg actually and consciously linked himself to him. They both understood Judaism as not about belief or practice, but a, about a tradition of reading texts. They both called for an exploration of the living texts of traditional Judaism as a basis for what they would have called an authentic Jewish identity. Jewishness was crafted, it was made, Judaism is a process, not a thing. It's a continual invention. So for both Flegg and Levinas, French re fresh readings of freely chosen Jewish ethical texts form the foundation of a modern French Jewish spirituality and self-understanding. So how did Flegg do this? What do we mean by a modern Jewish identity? And this is a major argument of my book. So as Lisa mentioned earlier, he was deeply affected by the 12 year scandal that engulfed the nation following the convictions of Captain Dreyfus, condemned and scapegoated in the public eye, precisely because he was a Jew. Flegg was shaken, in fact, into a newfound appreciation for his Jewish roots that he had left behind as a boy. He embarked on a study of the tradition he grew up in, but he had dismissed that tradition because he found it routine and wrote and devoid of spirituality. He established a new literary direction, which was devoted to reinterpreting biblical texts, including mystical stories of Moses, Solomon, and Jesus, and poetry based on Genesis and Psalms and legends, such as his play, The Jew in the Papal Court. He also wrote personal essays, such as Why I Am a Jew, and he wrote for a broad popular audience. At times his work was funny, at other times tragic, and other times filled with mystery and magic. Through his writings, his plays, novels, poems, and essays based on Jewish and Christian texts, Flegg constructed the contours of a Jewish collective, if selective memory, and offered a kind of cultural and spiritual if not traditionally religious uh, way of being a Jew. In fact, I mean, it wasn't about going to synagogue. It wasn't about 
traditional prayer uh, or ritual practice, but he encouraged secular French Jews to become or remain Jewish identified through literature. Flag constitute a unique way to reimagine Jew Jewishness through a messianic poetics, positing Jewish particularism in the context of French Republican citizenship and Jewish Christian reconciliation. In so doing, he fashioned a minority identity within French Third Republic universalism. And so why is that so important? It's important because in the universalist paradigm, uh, there is only that human beings are seen as, um, as the same, right? As being continuous across a horizontal. Um, citizens are thought to be, if you will, shorn of all their particularities. For Flagg, there was a tension between universalism the commonality among all humans and particularism, cultural practices, history. And this particularism could not and should not ever be, uh, I'm sorry, this tension, if you will, between the commonality among all of us and the particularism of particular cultures and historical phenomena should never be resolved. In fact, it's the dynamic reality of modern identity. We are fluid beings and we move between our understanding and our compassion as fully human beings and we are rooted in particular time and place. His writing spoke loudly to his contemporaries during the interwar period and perhaps Beckin even more forcefully in our own day. Flegg's vision constitutes an important attempt to construct a modern secular Jewish identity that's relevant to current wide ranging efforts at creating meaningful minority cultures in broader pluralist and multicultural societies. My second surprise, I asked myself, how did Flegg come to this project and what influences shaped him? And the first influence, so this is going to get a little philosophical, but we'll return. But the most important influence on him in his early years was the philosopher Henri Bergson. He exerted a powerful influence on Flake, and not only Flake, but a whole community of young intellectuals in Paris at the time. In the early 20th century, Bergson offered French intellectuals, he gave talks uh, at the Collège de France, both Christians and Jews were drawn to his talks. Uh, and so he, that was where he in, originally met the Catholic modernist Jacques Maritain and his wife, Raisa, because they were all in a way searching uh, for, uh, for a way to, to rethink uh, their disenchantment with philosophy, right? So the prevailing philosophical school at the time was scientific positivism or the belief that the world was knowable through its material manifestations. And it was a very pragmatic way of thinking about things, a very scientifically based. So on the one hand, this, young, this group of young folks uh, was looking for uh, an answer that was not positivistic. It wasn't uh, based on only material manifestations, but that it wasn't part of traditional religious institutional belief systems, right? They were um, disgruntled with regular Jewish practice. They were disgruntled with the Catholic church. It was spirituality they were after. And they were after spirituality that was delinked from institutional practice. So, Henri Bergson rejected completely this, uh, even the division between material and spirit, right? He rejected dualism or a dualistic way of thinking in favor of a philosophical system that articulated a continuity between spirit and material. So I just, I, what I was putting up on the screen here was just some words to understand um, Bergson's ideas as he rejected dualism or the distinction between spirit and matter in favor of this notion of continuity. 
And what I argue in the book is that Flegg's writing embodied the kind of anti-dualist continuity between material or intellect was another word that Bergson used and spirituality or spirit or intuition. Um, Bergson uh, identified politics with intellect and the realm of the material. And he argued that politics or the intellect divi divided people and that on a deeper level, on the spiritual level or what he called mystique, it was a space of human connectivity. This Bergsonian continuity between material and spirit undergirds Flegg's notion of identity. Identity for him is not discrete, it's not stable, but it's in constant movement between the material, the intellect and intuition and the spiritual between the particular material aspects of life and the universal spiritual ones. It was this understanding of continuity that shaped Flegg's work. This continuum, this movement between the particular details of everyday life, of history, of the potential and the potential of spiritual union that allowed Flegg to simultaneously engage very seriously with the details of daily life, with day-to-day -day workings in both Jewish and French uh, activity, but it also allowed him to maintain a vision of a transcendent universal harmony. Flegg was a Jewish writer who thought deeply about issues of identity. In fact, the, in, in similar ways that we do today, and he struggled to understand experiences of identity that we often seem to take for granted. Negotiating a Jewish path through the complex cultural world of French universalism and secularity or republicanism with its legacy of French Catholicism, Flegg understood identity as profoundly unstable, as fluid, and as forever moving from particular differences to universal shared values. It was never finite and it was never fixed. The third influence was very personal. The, uh, sorry, the second influence was very, was very, very personal. He was in love with a woman named Mary Claire, who was a Protestant woman from Geneva, which was also his hometown. In the end, Flegg chose family and career over his love for her and decided against marrying her. This painful decision marked him for the rest of his life and yet found partial resolve in his writing. The Jewish Christian unity he expresses in his writing seemed to offer him an avenue through which to reconcile, at least on paper, this emotional trauma of his youth. In a sense, he could do on paper what he couldn't do in real life. So my third surprise has to do with this notion of ecumenism. And ecumenism is a word that's often associated with the reconciliation of Christian churches. But at the heart of Flegg's work, we find a radical ecumenism that's not limited to that of Christian churches. And I'm using the word as he did to describe his version of a unity across diverse communities, religious and otherwise, in France, Europe, and beyond, and a rejection of exclusive and homogenous nationalism a deep understanding of the necessity of supporting vibrant minority subcultures in the context of a liberal republic. And it was the Great War, World War I, in which this ecumenism uh, really bore fruit for Flake. It's where he really had the, a, a tremendous experience in working with and being with um, folks from all over France, all over the colonies, all religious persuasions. Um, when war was declared in 1914 and President Raymond Poincaré called for national unity in the form of a sacred union to serve and protect the nation, Flegg, along with tens of thousands of Jews, heeded the call to fight as a way to prove their allegiance to France. And in the aftermath, he published an epic poem entitled The Wall of Weeping in 1929. It was published in English. And he produced a play called La Maison de Bon Dieu, 
Uh, and it's impossible to translate this title into English. It literally means the house of a good God. But really, somebody once said to me in, in German, the word was gemutlicht, um, which had this sense of like a very wonderful house that was full of warmth and welcoming, uh, had a welcoming spirit. So I just, I just for a moment, these are photographs of like from the First World War in his uniform. He was a bicycle messenger at the front and then Flegg and his wife, Madeline, and their children. Um, so the play featured the comradeship between three chaplains at the front, a rabbi, a priest, and a minister. And both the, the play and the poem, the epic poem, testified to the war's devastation, both physical and emotional, and aimed to offer a new ecumenical vision to post-war France and warn against returning to post-war hatreds. <clears throat> One reviewer summed up the play <clears throat> the, as a, the, the anti-doctrinaire intention of the play. He wrote, the characters are normal. They're human, not pathological. They're clear thinking and heartfelt. We will think <clears throat> that if an author brings three chaplains together, it's to show which one will convince the others that their doctrine can explain the silence of God when faced with the monstrous crimes of man called war. But that is not the case. We stay on the ground. The play ran for a hundred performances in Paris and then went on tour. And even in today's world, that would be a very successful run. Some criticisms of the play focused on the impossibility of maintaining a sacred union without a common external enemy. One critic wrote, La Maison de Bon Dieu is a house full of graces, but we live in apartments of six floors and we are too closely packed one against the other for the nastinesses and prejudice of hate not to live among us. For Flegg, the war forged deep human bonds, friendships that transcended differences of belief, accent, origin, or cultural practice. The message of the play, doctrine is narrow and confining, but human connection, love, and friendship is flexible and expansive. Flegg was unflinching in promoting his ecumenical beliefs during the 1920s, and even as Europe was arming itself for another war. Jewish participation in the First World War buoyed of what was, has been, was called at the time uh, the Jewish cultural flowering or Jewish awakening or Jewish Renaissance in post-war France. In the decade following the Great War, Jewish artists, writers, and scholars, many of whom had not thought so much about their Jewish identity before the war, articulated their Jewishness in multiple ways. And Flegg was a central figure in this Renaissance and through his writing, including his personal essay, Why I Am a Jew, and his semi-autobiographical autobiographical novel, The Boy Prophet, and his play, The Jew in the Papal Court, he was instrumental in shaping the public discourse on Jewishness in France. So one of the things that, um, the, the fourth surprise is that I came upon a treasure trove of letters that were written to him, uh, in which I could really see the impact of his writing. Um, the archive is full of these letters, hundreds and hundreds of them. Letter writers identified personally with his story they wrote, one wrote, I felt like I found my autobiography. I identify with you. Like you, I'm from Geneva. I was tormented by the Dreyfus affair. Another wrote, we will all find in, it, in this book, Why I Am a Jew, uh, what we need. It brought tears to my eyes. You make us one. Other letters focused on the way Flegg had reinvigorated Judaism. In your book, I have found Judaism with a heart, one, one writer. Uh, wrote in, in a postcard actually. Uh, and another said, Judaism is for a real life, a life loved. It's a recipe to help us establish the life of our great ones by giving us an example of a rescue for these times. Another letter said, yours is a rare book that surprises. And another, I had a revolution inside. I want to reconnect to my race. I've been searching for the living truth of my religion but I found only a religion of routine and convention like you. Readers responded to Flegg with their own stories, 
many of them attesting to a transformative engagement with his writing. I found your confession moving, one writer said, it will appeal to non-Jews too. Another correspondent penned, why I am a Jew will make the ink flow. Nothing you write is indifferent, but this one is less so than any other. It touches the life of the divine conscience, which develops only through the effort of man and in the conditions of balance. One can't be anti-Jewish without being anti-Christian. Translations broadened the readership from Berlin. Fritz Ehrenstein wrote to Flake, certainly you know that your books have a huge impact on young German Jews. Why I Am a Jew offers a path to rediscover Judaism. There were full translations published in German, English, Romanian, Norwegian, Portuguese, Italian, and later Hebrew. Taken together, these letters suggest that there was an audience for non-institutional forms of religion and spirituality. And through their letters to Plague, many readers found an opportunity to talk about their own religious or spiritual concerns and probe issues of identity and faith with someone who had himself experienced such tumult. By the mid 1920s, Flake had imagined and created a powerful Jewish identity that also found communion with other religions, especially Christianity. Flake's work generated a dynamic spirit among his readers and colleagues. The 1930s were marked by a decline in Jewish optimism in France. Jews experienced heightened anxiety in the face of rising anti-Semitism attributed to the steady uptick of Jewish immigration from the East, economic crises and political instability. Flake's engagement with real world quote unquote material uh, with, hu <clears throat> with human agency deepened. His 1930s biographies of the iconic biblical figures, Moses, Solomon, and Jesus, all carried calls to action and intervention while lifting up positive images of Jewish patriarchs. Flegg's Solomon, Moses, and Jesus depicted these figures as models of civic virtue and social justice, purveyors of ethics and laws. His characters increasingly express caustic criticism of contemporary politics especially the failure of the League of Nations to legislate disarmament. In November of 1939, as the possibility of another war seemed imminent, Flegg's younger son, Daniel, who had struggled with, struggled with a fragile constitution, uh, and uh, there's some sense to think that he, uh, now we would probably call or diagnose him with bipolar disease, um, but he committed suicide in 1939. In April of 1940, their daughter-in-law, Ayala, the wife of his older son, Maurice, gave birth to a stillborn baby. And only a few weeks later, Maurice was killed on the Flanders front as the German panzers rolled towards Paris. In acute distress after Maurice's death and the German occupation of Paris, Edmund and Madeleine sought refuge in their country house in the south of France, located between Marseille and Nice, uh, and the house is called Mas de Vieux Moulin. This is a photo of the house, the front of the house itself. And these are uh, scouts, Jewish scouts, which is what I'm gonna talk about next. Almost immediately, Flegg opened his home to the Eclaireur Israelite or the Jewish scouts, allowing them to camp out on his land. He led daily study sessions with them, which led to a publication entitled Le Chant Nouveau, After the War, the new song in English. Flegg's teachings and writings circulated among the scouts and the Jewish resistance, inspiring, as one resistant remarked, Flegg armed us with radical hope, which we needed to continue our dangerous clandestine work. Um, these are four of the, this is flag here in the turtleneck and the cap. And the other three are leaders of the resistance and the scouts. This is also taken at his home. And these images were from the Memorial de la Shoah, uh, the French archive uh, in Paris. So to conclude for Flegg, Jewishness was the particular and it resided in culture 
and history, in specific traditions and ancestral memory. Judaism, the religion, was universal and transcendent. It was an ethical system in line with Christianity. Flegg embraced both Jewishness and Judaism simultaneously and saw them as interdependent. In his writing, we see him working out how to hold both universal moral precepts and particular codes of differentiation in his hands at the same time. He articulated such an identity uh, that was neither, as I've mentioned, discrete or stable, but in constant movement between these particular historical aspects and universal ideal ones, both Jewish and French. This continuum, this movement between the messy details of life and the potential for spiritual union allowed Flegg to simultaneously engage with the workings of life and daily life and still work for what he would call a better tomorrow. And this brings me actually to my last surprise. And that surprise has to do with the problem of hope. We don't usually think of hope as a problematic, but in, in my work on him, it really became a problematic. At times, Flegg's instance, uh, insistence on universal harmony led, his, it led him really to a kind of blindness to facts on the ground. And at times he was criticized sharply for not taking politics seriously. As inspiration though, Flegg's messianic vision of the human capacity for ethical regeneration and union was profound. It inspired and nourished a younger generation of Jewish scouts and resistance fighters and those committed to Jewish Christian reconciliation after the war. But his disregard of politics and the safeguarding of rights at times even relegated even his notion of human agency to the mystical realm. In a sense, it was uh, at times a kind of mystical hope rather than what I might call a durable hope. It was not that he didn't recognize complex political realities and tensions, he did. Yet he looked forward always to their potential spiritual resolution and not to immediate and pragmatic needs for compromise or negotiation. And in that sense, hope is not a strategy. At other crucial times though, Flegg's radical hopefulness or prophetic imagination inspired others, especially young Jewish resistance fighters during the Second World War. And even as we know today, living through this pandemic, that psychologically, hopelessness is an identifier of depression. So hope has this incredibly important resonance for all of us. No doubt Edmund Flegg was an idealist of the first order and a member of an elite Parisian class of intellectual luminaries that flourished during the Third Republic. Yet his idealism was tempered by his attention to the varieties and contradictions of lived experience. His universalism was discursive, he seemed to be able to write his way on the page or on the stage into resolving tensions that were keenly experienced on the ground by Christians and Jews. And as such, it certainly had limitations, but it also had strengths as a cultural move, offering a discursive emancipatory challenge that imagined a French Republican universalism that did not obliterate cultural difference on the contrary, it was able to incorporate it and even celebrate it. And just to close, I want to suggest or to, to share with you that he has had quite a long afterlife uh, in France, um, even though we've never heard of him. <laughs> in Marseille, there is a, a centre flag, um, and it was founded in 1964, the year after he died. And it was formed to welcome and help repatriate Jews from North Africa. Today, actually, it maintains uh, a pluralist approach to French Jewishness, very much in the, in the spirit of Edmund Flake, and focuses on cultural forms and classes, and also works very closely with other denominations, with Christian and Muslim activist groups uh, in terms of fostering intercultural and interfaith dialogue in Marseille which is a very complicated city in France at this time. Um, 
And I would also say that his, his legacy is carried on by a rabbi in Paris. Her name is Delphine Orvieur, and she's um, one of the few women rabbis in France. And she also um, very much identifies in this, uh, in a kind of lineage with the way that Flegg thought about Jewish, uh, the work of being Jewish. So, so I'll close there and open for questions and I'll stop sharing my screen so we can see each other. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that wonderful talk. And I, I loved how you structured that with the different surprises that you found um, and how you explained to us a little bit how you got into Flake's story. Um, I encourage people to um, drop questions into the chat. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions for you um, myself as we're waiting for the other questions to come in. And, um, you know, as you were describing um, Flag and um, giving us an understanding of his intellectual points of view and sort of the um, hopefulness, um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that chapter in his life where he was inspiring the scouts um, because, you know, I, I sort of think of him as a man of action in many ways as well. I was really kind of surprised to find out that he enlisted in the First World War. He was 40 with two children. So, you know, he, he sort of, um, you know, maybe had these tendencies to ignore politics, but he also threw himself in the fray. And then after losing both of his sons, um, you know, really the the way that you describe it in the book um what he did with the scouts and also maybe his own experience in hiding um if if you could share a little bit of that um with us i i i think that would be wonderful um i think people might be interested in that um yeah he you know one uh, um at one point in that chapter that's the last chapter of the book before the epilogue um he says that the scouts are my children. Um, he really, he, you know, he, he was quite bereft uh, when he left Paris and after the death of his two sons and his, um, the, the grandchild that he didn't have. Um, and I think that inviting the scouts to come and live there at Beauvalon really um, buoyed him up in some way and it gave him purpose. Um, so the, <clears throat> in 1940, when the Germans uh, occupied Northern France, the, uh, the Southern France was, um, was known to us as Vichy France, although Vichy controlled the legal system in the North as well. Um, but it wasn't occupied until 42 by the Germans. And until that point, there were um, there were, were arrests and there were deportations, but um, but there were um, but Jews lived somewhat freely, especially native what what are called native French Jews, uh, as opposed to Eastern European immigrants uh, who were probably increasingly denaturalized by the revocation of naturalization laws, um, and then they could be arrested and deported for for being um, stateless. But for French Jews like Flag, they were actually um, pretty safe in the South up until 42. And the scouts set up, uh, uh, along with other resistance um, groups, Jewish resistance groups, kind of communal farms. Uh, there were a couple famous ones. Um, and they mostly took care of children. And they took care of children whose parents had been de deported or whose parents were in hiding. And they moved a lot of children out of France um, uh, clandestinely. They moved them to Spain uh, and they moved them to Switzerland. Um, and so it's the leadership of the scouts that really congregate around Flegg uh, at, uh, at his house in Beauvalon where he does these teachings, these daily teachings. And, and they carry his work, his teachings out back uh, to their work in these farm settlements. Um, and so, you know, on these mimeograph sheets, right, this work starts to percolate around the Jewish resistance. And when you read some of the testimony 
of Jewish resistance um, um, members who survived the war, you know, his, this, this, it, you know, what was moving to me was how spiritual food is in fact really necessary and that food, food isn't enough and that he really supplied the spiritual nourishment um, for, for, the, for, for a whole network of scouts and resistors in the South. Um, so it's a pretty marvelous story. And then he goes into hiding. There's a very famous priest um, in Marseille, Père Benoit, and he's the one who helps Flag and Madeline go into hiding. A priest hides them uh, not just outside of Lyon uh, for the duration of the war. And even then they're meeting and talking about um, with um, Jews and Christians, they're meeting and talking about how to approach the Vatican after the war and how the Vatican is gonna deal with this and how to, uh, you know, basically they're setting the stage for Vatican II um, during the war itself. So yeah, he was a man of action. I mean, I'm, you know, so I get so engrossed in his writing um, that it, it almost seems like it, it's secondary, but it really obviously isn't secondary. You're muted, Lisa. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Was that, did that come close to what you were? Yes, yes. About? And this sort of, um, I wasn't really, personally when I read the book, I didn't know as much about the scouts and the farms and, and then that Flag was at the center of that. I found that really fascinating. And again, um, this idea of spiritual food, um, this is something we could you know keep carrying with us. Um, and um, I have more questions, but I want to share ones that have, have dropped into the chat now. Um, and um, I think two of them are actually quite similar. Um, Professor um, Gershon Shafir, um, my colleague, has written, um, I'd like to ask you to place Flag in the double context of other European Jewry's assimilationist aspirations and subsequent anti-Semitic backlash. How do his views of Jewish identity fit in with the other proposed identity versions that we find in Europe? I think I'm gonna start with a second part of that question. <laughs> um, because I think, um, you know, one of the, I think one of the reasons, um, or, you know, to go back to my initial question, why haven't we ever heard of him, right? That he kind of embraced or embodied a certain kind of Franco-Judaism, right that lisa moses left writes about and in, in her beautiful study um, of 19th century french jewry and um and he sort of moves it forward he moves it in uh, a more modern modernist uh, trajectory but um so in france at least right now from uh, from what i gather um you know that kind of synthesis of Jewishness and Frenchness is much harder to find. And which is why I mentioned Delphine Orvieur as one, one, one body where, where, that, where she does interfaith work, where she's continuing in this kind of way of thinking. Um, in general, the, the French Jews tend toward being religious on the one hand and or Zionist on the other hand. Um, and so this, um, um, and, and thinking about, I guess, thinking about identity in more, um, more national or essentialist terms. And Flake was not an essentialist. I mean, it's just, he just wasn't. And he really understood identity as, um, as process and practice and not as something essential or part of an essence or that you're born with. I mean, any for him, anybody who wanted to be a, a Jewish scout could be a Jewish scout, whether they were Jewish or not. I mean, that was, uh, he was the president of the scouts and that wasn't, you, you wanted to be a Jewish scout, you were a Jewish scout. And uh, I think that we in this moment are, are much more, there's much more engagement with um, notions of essentialism in identity in the on the left and the right, frankly, um, in the United States and abroad. 
Um, so I don't know if that uh, answers the second part of the question. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I, I think that I can talk about Flegg in particular, that one of the things he, 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 he was not, before he turned to Jewishness as, as, as his creative force and as his central core, um, he was, as I said, as I mentioned before, he was a playwright, he was a dilettante. He said himself, he called himself a dilettante. Um, he, uh, he was a decadent artist living in Paris, you know, going to the Ecole Normale. And um, he didn't, he, he wasn't identified uh, in, in Jewishly in any, in any way. Uh, and, and in fact, he, un, not unlike many in his generation, sort of it, it felt, you know, in a sense forced <laughs> that Dreyfus affair made them Jewish. Um, and, uh, and that was the turn. That was when he he made that turn. I don't know that he thought. Uh, well, someone called him. Um, I think I write about this in the first chapter of the book that he was he was the quintessential assimilated Jew. <laughs> I mean, he had made it. <laughs> he you know, in, in if that's the goal, he definitely had made it um, until he didn't. Right until until the affair. Um, and, you know, so I guess, you know, one way to think about right, Jewish identity, right, is this tension between cultural adaptation and anti-Semitism, right? There's, there's this tension be between how, I mean, if, if in fact all Jews just assimilated culturally, then, you know, I'm not sure we would still be here to be telling the story, but um, but that this tension between culturalism, cultural acculturation, sort of trying to avoid the word assimilation, and anti-Semitism is that pull, is that tension that um, in, in an odd way has um, enlivened and um, generated Jewishness, uh, at least in the modern period. I'm not sure I answered your question. Professor Shafir, do you want to unmute yourself and 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 um, tell me whether I have or not? <laughs> no, no, no. You have gone a very long way towards uh, addressing the question. Indeed, I was curious to see how the uh, Dreyfus affair has has uh, has made him into what uh, you know made him into the character that you uh, described to us and the choices that he uh, made. But the point was that I was asking, uh, 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 has he turned again? He has turned clearly against assimilation. That's what's distinctive about him, because there are many right. others who did not. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, that he, he in fact, um, lifts up Jewishness. And, you know, what's interesting about the book, Why I Am a Jew, is it was published by Ryder, R-E-I-D-E-R -E Press, which was a famous, well-known French publishing house. But it was part of a series, Why I Am a Radical, Why I Am a This, Why I Am a That, Why I Am a Jew. So he was very, and in oddly, he was very mainstream, but the way he was mainstream was to be fundamentally Jewish and French. Um, because, you know, and somebody said something to me the other day that I thought was super interesting, which was that we can't talk about American culture without talking about African American culture. They are so interwoven that there is no American culture separate from African American culture, really. I mean, if you really keep teasing down, right? But I would, and I was thinking, well, the same thing's actually true about French culture. You actually can't separate French culture unless you were to go down to a, like some farmhouse in, in the South of France, right? But French culture and is, in, is completely intertwined with French Jewish culture and Jewish culture. I mean, Bergson was a, was a French Jew. I mean, he, I think he converted at some point to Christianity, but, um, 
I think that, you know, Jewishness is very, it's, it's very much part of French culture. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, Karl Shorsky and Steve Beller argued the same for Viennese culture. Right, so. right. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. And I, I think this question um, that um, Gershon posed meshes with Lynn Breaker's question a little bit. I don't know if you can see it in the chat. It was a question above and I, I see he's just, I'm not sure if he's still with us, um, but this um, question about anti-Semitism being the force behind the pursuit of French Jewish existence, which I take to mean, you know, a French Jewish existence, a, you know, a, a kind of balance and accepting or a, uh, the way that Frank lifts his Jewishness up. Um, and then he has a question about the diversity stance um, as plan B for American Jews today. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I think he just left, so we can't, can't quite parse that out. But I don't know if you, if you have a thought about the lessons of this for um, the American situation that you were just referencing. Um, for, for Jews? You know, I, I mean, diver I, I don't really understand the part about plan, a diversity plan as plan B for American Jews. Well, maybe um, you back his screen just, I didn't want to skip that. <laughs> we need clarification no. of it. Um, yeah, um, so maybe we'll, we can come back unless you, you have a thought that that sparks for you. We do have another question as well. Well, I just, you know, I, I guess I'm a little, the anti-Semitism stuff is rough um, because, um, it's not that it doesn't exist or didn't exist, of course, um, but it's not what he wrote about. So, and it's not what actually he was that interested in. Mm -hmm. He was constantly interested in, um, in, 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 in the commonalities between, I mean, between Christianity and Judaism on an ethical level. And, um, I mean, he has this one line where in the book on Jesus, which is actually one of my favorite books um, that he wrote, and um, it's called The Story of Jesus as Told Through the Wandering Jew. So I, I'm sure you've read it, Lisa. Um, but I, I, I don't know if this line would stick out to you because you're reading for different reasons. But at one point he writes, when all Christians are really Christians or become really Christians, then Jews will be Christians too. And I think like for a lot of, <laughs> that, must have, that must be somewhat shocking for people to read, for Jews to read, right? Um, but I think for him, you know, things that, uh, that, that he was interested in this, in thinking about a, a how do we get from here, <laughs> from this place that we're in, right? This really hard place bordering on fascism here in the United States of America. How do we get to that other place, right? To the place where, where, we, um, where we can recognize our, the humanity in one another. Mm -hmm. um, so, he, so that's what he wrote about. Yeah, no, I think I think that definitely addresses that line. It did stand out to me actually, um, because it it you know other people have said I, that in different different ways with different. It reminds me a little bit of something that Martin Luther said, but from a totally different point of view. Um, so it, it, his ecumenicalism is really radical um, in some ways. Um, I want to I want to pick up another question in the chat um, from another of my colleagues, Professor Cohen. Um, who was asking about Flake's character formation. And you, you did talk about this a little bit, um, his, his parents, um, but there is that, um, in the book you explore, I think in um, a very um, illuminating way, the, the sort of sense of um, the, his not really understanding his father's or his parents' relationship to Judaism and that sort of, feeling of spiritual rootlessness that he had when he was younger and the way that he um, came back. You've, you've alluded to it, but um, I think it might be worth um, a, or a way to address this question, um, talking about that a little bit more and his relation to his parents. Yeah, yeah. His relationship with his father in particular is, is very striking. Um, he was, he was um, alienated from Judaism 
of his parents, because from a, from his child perspective, um, it seemed very empty and rote. Like his father never, you know, it was actually not so different from my grandfather at the Seder table who would like race through the Seder and in Hebrew and then we would eat, you know? And, you know, I think about that and then like how, you know, we've taken to doing Seders now and they last for hours and hours and we talk and we read and we sing and, you know, that, but that in Flag's household, you know, that these, he saw him late fill in, he saw him, um, Davin, but he it was never explained to him. It, he was never brought into any of the spiritual aspects of it. He just sort of saw it as a form and it seemed quite empty to him. Um, he did have a bar mitzvah, but he had, and he writes about this. He said he had no, he had no understanding at all what he was saying. So he memorized his parsha and then he had no idea what he was doing. And then it was this bar mitzvah was conferred upon him and it felt empty. Um, and it, it didn't, it didn't feel meaningful to him. And so, um, the book, I think that is, so he wrote this quasi autobiographical book called L'Enfant Prophète or the Child Prophet. And where he tells these stories, um, basically about his own family. Um, and he and he also writes about meeting a girl, a little girl at Notre Dame, <laughs> and how he is um, he's smitten by by I mean who's not smitten, <laughs> but by you know the music and the pageantry and the ritual and the richness of of, of mass and um, and he you know the 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 story is basically him going to these various people. He goes to the rabbi, he goes to his parents, he goes to the scouts, he goes to the French scouts, he goes to the Jewish scouts, he goes to the Zionists, trying to find, you know, a home. <laughs> and, and it's really not until, and this is the, then in a way, the punchline, right? It's not until he discovers Jesus and that he knows Jesus is Jewish, that it all starts to make more sense to him. And, um, but it's a wonderful, it's a, it's, it's short and it's a wonderful piece of writing about sort of very much through the eyes of a little boy. And, um, and so, so when he leaves home and he leaves home when he's young, it's like 17 or 18, he goes to Paris for schooling, uh, maybe even a little younger because he does one, no, he goes to Louis Le Grand, the Lycée Louis Le Grand, and then he goes to the Sorbonne for one year and then he goes um, to the Ecole Normale, um, and he does a, a, a and, and he writes on philosophy, and he goes he goes to Germany to do his his abroad his abroad program in Leipzig, and um, and that's when the Dreyfus affair starts to first hit, and then and then there's a wonderful book of published letters actually between him and his friend, who's a right wing supporter of Maurice Barres. And so, but they keep having this correspondence um, about Dreyfus, about Judaism. Um, and, and he also writes to his mother and he also, it's when he begins to have this soul searching experience and finds his way to, to Jewishness in, a, in his way. Yeah. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Alain, if you want to. Um want to ask. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful talk. I am a proponent of the arc of life. In other words, it's not that at the end of life or in the middle of life that you find your truth. In other words, flag as a dilettante is just as fundamental as flag finding his way later on. And I think we have to integrate the questions that he had regarding the way in which the Dreyfus affair led him to a certain uh, sense of identity that he didn't have before, in the same way as Hitler forced us to become Jews, despite ourselves, so to speak, if we were accultured, as you say. So in a certain way, I like very much this arc, and I think that every step is fundamental instead of finding the truth at the last moment. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, and no, I love that, actually. And, um, you know, the, I, 
so um, Lisa had asked me about the archive and because in the beginning of the book, there's a note on the archive, the paper archive is missing. It's been missing. So the only thing we have is, a, is a, um, what's it called? Microfilm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> terrible. <Yeah. laughs> but, um, so, and the archivist um, who put Flake's work on microfilm, wonderful man named Georges Vey, who's become a dear friend of mine. And um, he had actually met Flake in his lifetime. And he was the archivist who put his work on microfilm. And then all of the paper archive went missing. It was supposed to be going to Jerusalem. It never made it there. Mm. We don't know. But on that microfilm, there is, um, there are images of a handwritten journal that he kept in the, um, when he was, I must have been 17 and 18. And it is so beautiful to read because he's writing about his own sexuality. He's writing about um, what to believe in. You know, it's, it's, it's a young man's um, kind of pouring of questions and meaning and where is it and how do I find it? <laughs> um, and platonic relationships and what is love. And it, it's so um, moving to me. And I, you know, it, of course I wondered, you know, were there more of such volumes that never made it onto the microfilm? I don't know. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just a footnote, you know, in French, when you say the bon Dieu, it's a redundant expression. It's, you can say Dieu as much as le bon Dieu. So it's, oh, not, okay. it's not necessarily. Oh, so, it's, so it's just like the house of goodness or God or well, the house wellness. God, the house of God. It's not gemutlich. Uh, it's really basically uh, fatig, just as when in a clause you repeat and repeat, you know, you know, as you're speaking. Oh, okay, that's so helpful. That yes. makes more sense, right? Because it, because of the chaplains that are all billeted there. So the three chaplains are all living in this God house. Yes. <laughs> and and, and also sometimes le bon Dieu, uh, it's, Hashem is referred to as le bon Dieu in French, just as, as a word. Oh. <laughs> Oh, word. now I, I want to go back and it, it's practically change it. Yes. <laughs> it's formulaic. It's formulaic. Right. Yes, exactly. Right. That's the word I was looking for. Yo, thank you. I wish it wasn't published already. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. You write another book. <laughs> thank you so much. Indeed. You're welcome. Thank you. So we had another question um, from David Weinberg, um, and if he writes, for all his strong attachment to French values and culture, Flagg was also drawn to the spiritual ideal of the land of Israel and the Zionist idea as central to his Jewish identity. How did he balance these seemingly contradictory impulses? Um, and so I wondered if you if you wanted to address that, because along with the Wandering Jew book, right, there's the book Ma Palestine, which is from the same 1930 trip um, where he does, you know, we start to see that um, at least in its later form coming through. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the fifth chapter of the book is uh, is called My Palestine, My France. And um, and it is about his Zionism. And, you know, his Zionism goes through, um, you know, I, I'm gonna go back to, um, to Professor Cohen here with this arc, right? He goes, he has a long journey with Zionism, like he had a long journey with a lot of things. And, you know, he goes from, um, he went to one of the um, Zionist, first Zionist Congresses, um, and and then he falls away from it. He 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 is not. He he sort of is initiated in a, sort of initiated, and then he moves away. Um, I think because he he's very um, he's very wary of uh, even at, at, at that early time he was wary of kind of um, exclusive belongings. Um, as, and I think the way I talk about it in the book is I talk about his, his understanding of multiple attachments or the capacity we have for multiple attachments. And 
you know, it fits with his understandings um, of identity being not fixed and that, um, that we, we attach in lots of ways as humans. Um, and I think, so, so he then, I think you're right to suggest it. he does have this very spiritualized idea of Palestine as a, but not unlike most French middle-class and upper middle-class Jews, um, Palestine pre in, during the mandate period, it was very good for Eastern European Jews because they were being persecuted and they should have a place to go. But French people didn't need to go there. And you know, the Alliance Israelite as the sort of organization of uh, French Jewry was, it, it, maybe not explicitly anti-Zionist, but did not really deal with Zionism. It wasn't what it was interested in. Um, and Flag, Flag had a very interesting pluralistic way of managing the Jewish world in France um, in the 20s and 30s. As president, as I said, as president of the Jewish Scouts, he welcomed everyone religious Jews, secular Jews, Eastern European Jews, French Jews, Zionists, not Zionists, Hasidim. I mean, it was a mishmash and it was one of the only places where there was that kind of mixing um, because people stayed very much, you know, in their, what we call silos now. Um, and, you know, he was, he, he was ecumenical and pluralistic, even in the, in the Jewish world, uh, in that way. So, so for him, Palestine had this spiritual dimension that, uh, I think I said something in the book that, you know, that, that, you know, what is it, Louis Brandeis says that Zionism makes people better, makes, makes uh, Jews better Americans. And I would, and I would say, Flag, Flag thinks that you know Zionism and Palestine or Zionism makes people better humans. <laughs> you know that it's it's our most ideal best selves, right? And of course, that shifts uh, in the 1930s, um, and um, and so I'll before I get to the end of the 30s. So in his book, My Palestine, I think some of the things that are the most interesting is he's very attentive to telling us, tells us lots of stories in that book about um, farmers and Brit Shalom members and all kinds of Arabs and Jews and um, uh, Amer not Americans, but British Jews who are also there. And, um, and he tells us stories. So he tells us a story that he's in a taxi driver with a taxi driver going somewhere and a woman, an Arab woman with a big basket on her head filled with fruit, it falls and she stumbles and, um, and a taxi driver stops the cab and gets out and helps her pick up all of her fruit from the street. And then he says, here, come in my taxi and I'll take you to the market or wherever she was going. She had never been in a taxi before. and he. You know, he tells this story because those are the things that really mean something to him, right? That moment where the Jewish taxi driver is, is picking up the fruit with the Arab woman with him, and then they're in the taxi, that's the moment where human connection is forged. That's the moment where people are connecting as people, and that's what becomes very, very important to him. And that's why I mean when I was saying at the end that the politics of the mandate um, you know, he didn't write about that very much in, in his book. And he, in some ways, is taken to task for not getting it, <laughs> not seeing, you know, if you will, facts on the ground. And, um, and then later, what I was going to say, um, later in 1939, he actually um, does help um, uh, he does contact um, the Rothschilds to be able to fund arms for the Haganah who are helping the British put down an Arab uprising. I mean, there are different ways you can tell that story. Um, but, you know, from the vantage point that I had, it, you know, it was hit, it was looking at the arc of his relationship to Palestine and to Zionism that had gone from something spiritual and then the possibility, I mean, he writes 
In Ma Palestine, right, he writes about Arabs are our brothers and there'll be a day when we're together and um, to this moment when he's helping fund um, weapons um, in, in which the, um, the Arabs understand um, at that point that, that the Jews are, uh, the Jews in Palestine, the Zionist Jews in Palestine are um, supporting the British in keeping the uprising down and putting the uprising down. And, you know, that's a, that's a whole morass of colonial politics right there. Um, uh, and one we're living with continually. So, um, but, but just to say that there is, I like the way that um, Professor Cohen said this arc, right? And there was this arc of his own thinking about and working with Zionism. Uh, and, and, but then also to add, after the war, he, he sat on the French desk of the um, World Zionist Organization. I was in Jerusalem at those archives. And, um, uh, and his real concern, or one of his major concerns, was diasporic Judaism. And he was very worried that there would be all this attention focused on the new state, on Israel, and that, that the, the Jews living outside the state of Israel would no longer um, be, you know, supported. And, and that there would be, in a sense, the end of diasporic Judaism. And that was a real fear for him. Um, and, he, and he kept raising it. Like, we have to think about Jews and the diaspora, not just about Israel. Um, so it's a lot right there. <laughs> just yeah. un unmute Mr. Weinberg and you can, you can follow. Yeah, one, uh, another irony in all of this, of course, is that he was, so close to the Eclaireur and so influential. And yet those who survived, the leaders who survived almost to the man and woman made Aliyah. Right. Strongly Zionist, Gamzon and others. Right. And, so and Gamzon was like his nearest and dearest. Yeah, that's yeah. sort of interesting too. It, uh, it raises questions about what sort of influence he had on that generation, at least philosophically or intellectually. Uh, well, Gamson was quite young, much younger than him. Um, but the entire crew. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. No, and I was thinking, I, I, I did do some reading about this um, because there were all these debates that went on after the war um, in the scouts, but then they changed their name to something else. And, um, and there were all these discussions about what their role should be and whether and being in France or, or making Aliyah and going to Israel. And, and there was disagreement and who should and what oh, and whether there should be a Zionist plank in the in their sort of you know mission statement, so to speak. And Flake argued against it. And uh, and initially he won and then he didn't. It's my my memory of that. But um, but yes. And um, yeah, he didn't, I don't think he ever returned to Israel. I think it was, all, oh no, he did return. He went, um, he went in the fifties uh, as part of the Alliance, I think. The, the, uh, the relationship to the previous uh, question I had is uh, in terms of uh, the scouts, the Eclaireur de France, et cetera. It's fascinating, that's why I was asking about his uh, ob primary objectives, his parents. Basically, you have in the Eclaireur, in the Scouts, you have such a, an emphasis on conscience. You see, you're dominated by the superego. And in being dominated by the superego, <laughs> obviously, you're going to answer to something which is going to be appealing, dr uh, driving yourself to the should rather than the desire. And the, the, the éclaireur subsume themselves in a collective instead of being very individualistic. And so that's fascinating when you think about what you just mentioned regarding his return to France after Israel and um, 
and again in the ark palestine was a, a byway on the way to israel and to the conditions that we have today it's it's really extraordinary but uh, i would say his conscience there uh, driven by his conscience despite the the kind of conflict that he had with his father from what you mentioned which i i like very much uh, hmm. well as somebody who grew up in a labor zionist scouting movement um you're 100 percent right <laughs> and it, it takes a long time to un undo undo all of the all of that, all of that bound, bound to the collective. Absolutely, to unbind, to decant, it's really frighteningly difficult. I love very much the story about his bar mitzvah, uh, reciting by rot and not knowing what he's saying and being forced to do it and disavowing it uh, is really magnificent. It does correspond precisely to the statute of uh, Jews being French first, and then remembering that there was something else as well, until the Dreyfus affair, until uh, Nazi Germany. Anyways, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a long story, but you are marvelous. I, I can't wait to read your book. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you for these questions. They're really great. David, Um, did I... Did I, um, I didn't want to cut you off. I think it's really, it's a really interesting observation that, um, you know, this generational split, and I'm sure you're right that it was a very generational, uh, um, I mean, at that point, he's what, um, let's see, he's, he's in his late seventies um, at the end of the war, right? I mean, he dies when he's 89, and that's in 63. So he's in his 70s. Of course, 70 now is the new 40. So, <laughs> but yeah, I think that this this point about the generations is important. Um, doesn't he? Doesn't he also have contact with Aimé Pellier, which the which? Yeah, 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 yeah. He was a character. An interesting story in and of itself. Yeah. In the yeah, the but he was very close to many Christians. Um, because after the war, we didn't get a chance to talk about this, but after the war, he begins with Jules Isaac. He, be, yep. he starts this Christian Jewish fellowship um, organization, which is still going. And uh, it's, it's, it's international, it's not just French, but um, the French chapter is still going. And he was, um, he was very, very much in this uh, world of, uh, into Jewish and Christian intellectuals uh, who were thinking about these issues. Sally, this has just been so wonderful and such a rich discussion of Flag in his life. I, I did, I, I sort of showed you some questions in advance and I think unless there's any other questions that pop up in the chat, I might just ask you um, just one of them to try to round out because I, um, you know, in thinking about um, the idea of legacy, which you discuss um, in really interesting ways in the book, um, and the way that Flag picks up, you know, his legacy as a Jew, and then if we think about Flag's legacy, um, you know, I, I, I'm an outsider really to French history, French politics, and and the current scene. I read with interest, but I. I um, know what I read in the papers about the situation of French Jews right now, um, but I wondered if if you had any thoughts about Flag's legacy um, and and what it might mean, you know, in the context of France in 2022, or what it might mean for us in 2022. Um, you know, that, because I, I find his radical pluralism. Um, I mean, for me, that's a kind of hope. I, you know, whether I agree with every little bit of it or not, it his, you know, his strength as a person seems to come from that belief in connection and and as you're saying, and you know, on a small scale and also on a larger scale. Um, but I I wondered if if um, you had any thoughts about that that legacy, um, either in the you know French context or or more broadly. Um. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, things are challenging in France right now, not so dissimilarly from how they are challenging for us here. And, um, you know, the, the fact that there's um, a Jewish 
Algerian Jewish man running on, you know, for president who's to the right of Marine Le Pen is, uh, who's more anti-immigrant <laughs> than Marine Le Pen is like, it's mind boggling. It's, and I don't, you know, it's like, I think it's very hard for friends of mine in France to even, you know, try to comprehend, you know, what's what's happening. And, um, but, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I wish that I, I, I wish I could say that his legacy, you know, I think, I guess, I guess what I would say is there are really good people in France and there are really good people here and people who are embracing notions of pluralism, notions of um, expansive community rather than narrow community. And, um, but it's, a, it's, you know, it's, a, it's fierce there. I would say that, um, I don't know if any of you know Delphine Orvier, the, the rabbin, she's, um, I went to her talk, she gave, I, I've been to services at her, synagogue in Paris, and she's quite a wonderful rabbi. She trained here at the Hebrew Union College, and one of my dear friends here in New York was her teacher. And because of that, um, I went to a, a talk she gave at the Maison Francaise at Columbia University a couple of years ago in the, in the before times. <laughs> and, um, and I went with my friend who was her teacher, Rabbi Lisa Grant, and um, so I got to meet her afterwards, which was the really fun part. But she gave this wonderful talk about identity and about, um, and it was it, it was a um, it was very Phlegian. <laughs> There's no other way to to describe it. I mean, she she talked about. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not going to be able to summon it right now, but but there was a way in which she she also understood the fluidity. Of, of, of consciousness and fluidity of identity and attachment. And she, but, and she sourced it um, in Jewish text, uh, which was really lovely. And then I had a very long talk with her afterwards. Um, and because she does see herself very much in line with him, that she, she says very clearly that she is, you know, part of his legacy, even though she's a rabbi, not a poet, but but she sees herself in that in that way. And there are other rabbis, but they're very few. The what they call the liberal uh, world of um, Judaism in France right now. It's it, it's not very big, and um, I think there are only three. Correct me if I'm wrong. Three women rabbis. Um, I've been to services of two of them, and they were both amazing. <laughs> and um, uh, and I think, I mean, but Delphine in particular, she's a very public person. She's a public intellectual. She's a writer. Uh, she's not. She's not just a just a pulpit rabbi. Uh, and she's very beloved, not not just by uh, progressive the progressive Jewish world in France, but by the progressive world in France, because she does a lot of interfaith dialoguing. Um, and she's very powerful in that way. Uh, and I would say, you know, similarly here, thinking about, um, uh, well, here we haven't, you know, lots of Jewish organizing going on here. I don't know what's happening out there, but things like Ben the Ark and, um, Jews for Economic and Racial Equality, and they're, they're organizations that have at their core social justice missions that go beyond, uh, uh, that, that are not, um, that are invested in, um, in a broad sense uh, of um, uh, um, uh, intervening in American politics and um, in, 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 in inequalities, not just for Jews, right? Um, but in a much broader sense. But I, you know, the work is there for us to do. I mean, I, I don't know, I wish I had a cheerier story. I would, I would say that I was at the Centre Flag um, in 2020. And I found, I was incredibly inspired there. There was um, an exhibit of photographs of bread 
making bread and bread on the walls of this community center, this cultural center. And it was bread from all around the world. And there was um, then, uh, and that evening there was an event um, the photographer was there who had taken these beautiful photographs of bread. And, um, and there was a whole conversation about bread, right? And bread as this fundamental source of life <laughs> and this, uh, this uh, the nourishment of bread and the ways in which we share a practice of breaking bread and breaking bread together. Um, and it was an event that, that where they were hosting representatives from various Christian communities in Marseille and Arab communities in Marseille and Jewish communities, because the, the truth is in Marseille, they don't, the, the Jews don't speak to each other. They're um, Algerian Jews and Tunisian Jews and Moroccan Jews and uh, German Jews and uh, French Jews. I mean, there's, there's all this division and Marseille, you know, which used to be a, a red city, right? As part of the, the the socialist south of France, you know, is now an incredibly right wing bastion, <laughs> um, and they're on the front lines trying to do this interfaith dialogue. And they, at, when I was last there, they wanted to do this event called Tout Marseille, um, where they, you know, were kind of this exhibition of you know work from all of these various um, communities. And um, never happened, obviously, because we got a pandemic instead. Um, but my my goal is to go back there. I want to do some work with them because I I'm, I'm thinking that my next project will be in Marseille, and I want to do something more contemporary and look at interfaith organizing in Marseille um, and Jewish communities and um, in in Marseille because it's yeah. I got very interested when I was there. So I wish I had more optimism to share with you, but I just think, you know, this is our work right now. You're muted, Lisa. <laughs> Sorry, there was a, um, the dog was barking, so I muted it. <laughs> um, so, um, but I think the the bread exhibition um, is a, is a really nice way to round things out because we talked about flag and sort of spiritual food or the sustenance that you <laughs> need to, you know, and that's a kind of focus on a literal food, but using it to try to, you know, create that kind of connection, that sort of same kind of community sustenance for the entire community um, through connection that flag would have supported, I think. Um, so that that's a nice, a nice image and the, the way that you end the book talking about the center and um, you know I follow them on social media now since reading the book but um, I'd love to go visit the center myself someday.